teaching the technical aspects of photography will never prove to be too challenging. It's relatively easy to grasp the concepts of shutter speed, aperture, depth of field and ISO. However, teaching the elements of composition is much more problematic indeed. How to arrange the objects and elements within a scene is a real personal creative interpretation of the world around you. It's not a simple black and white. It's not something you can grasp immediately. It's something which will prove to be a continual process of professional development. Ultimately, your photos live and die on the success of composition. So, what is composition and why is it important to your photography? On a technical level, composition is simply the arrangement of elements within a scene. Artistically, it's about how you interpret what you're viewing and how you show the viewer your interpretation of the world. The human brain is incredibly skilled at filtering out information. All of the background clutter here will fade into insignificance because you know that I'm the person talking to you and that's what you should be focusing on. This brightly coloured jacket probably also grabs your attention. Now the camera is not quite as selective. When you take a photograph, it's recording everything that's in the scene. So it's your job as a photographer and the artist to be able to lead the viewer through that scene and to be able to tell them the story of your image. You have to direct them to what you want them to look at. Now, when I decide to take a photograph, the first thing that I think about is the story. What am I trying to convey to the viewer? What's the narrative of the scene or the image that I want to create? Once I've decided upon the narrative and the story of the scene, I can then think about how best to compose my image and how best to arrange the elements within that scene in the strongest, most impactful way for the viewer. Ultimately, a photograph is just the arrangement of elements within a confined frame and how you place those will directly determine how successful that image is. There are a whole host of different guides and tools that you can use when trying to get the best composition for an image. Without going into an exhaustive list, we've got things like the rule of thirds, golden ratio, symmetry, texture, foreground interest, use of colour, juxtaposition, framing, frames within a frame, leading lines, we've got odd numbers, we've got the use of triangles, and over the course of a few videos, I'm going to start to talk about these in a wider context, which hopefully will give you more ideas about how to get the best out of any location that you're visiting and shooting. Now, scale is another very useful compositional tool. As I walk into this shot, I'll become larger in the frame because I'm getting closer to the lens. The further away I am, the less important I am and the less attention I will demand. The closer I come to the lens, the more impact I have and the more of your attention and focus I will be demanding. Now, that's pretty important as a photographer because scale can be used to really generate impact and drama within any scene. Ultimately, it leads into another element which is filling the frame, as indeed my face is doing right now. Also, scale will start to determine the size of objects within an image. If you have a giant mountain, but you have nothing there that the viewer can recognise size-wise, it's difficult to know just how big that mountain is. Put a person into the scene and instantly you have a point of reference. A person, a building, a tree. These are all things that have generally a typical size and the viewer can relate to that and start to understand a little bit more about the narrative of your shot. As we've just been talking about scale within images, I'm going to skip in and show you a shot where the main element is actually quite small. 
In this image of Glencoe, it's one of the little cottages that sits just at the back of Glencoe, at the side of the main road. You can see that the cottage actually doesn't really take up that much space within the composition. The background is full of mountain and it's full of negative space. Again, shot with a slightly longer focal length. It's on the 70 to 200 mil lens again, compressing all that down and flattening it. Again, it's here all about desolation and isolation. It's all about showing you the story of a typical Scottish winter. The deeper story is that it's about mankind and our determination and desire to cling on into some pretty harsh environments and to really battle it out and make these places our homes against the elements and against the odds we still do this. And that's what I want to try and get across in this particular shot. Now, when you're looking at this, the cottage, because most people understand the typical size of window, typical size of door, you get a real sense of scale for the mountain behind. Now, I've taken the top of the mountain out here, I've cropped it so it fills the frame. And that gives you no reason to look elsewhere. There's no distracting elements to it. Now, I shot some wider shots of this as well, where you can see the tops of the mountain. I shot them with wider um, angle lenses, and all of these give a real different shot, different composition, different perspective, different mood and feeling. This is the one that I quite like because it was my original vision for the shot. And although I experimented and explored whilst still there, this was the one that I went to shoot, I shot it, and it actually was my favorite image. That's not always the case, which again is why I keep repeating work a location. Make sure you've really put the effort in. Don't just rest on your laurels. You have to, have to find the location, find the shot, and then be patient. But you have to put the work in first to be in the right position at the right time. So here we have an arrangement of boats within the scene. Now this is a really rough example just while I'm on location here filming this video. At the moment, it looks interesting and there is a little bit of foreground, effectively just a strip of grass. However, there's nothing in that foreground. It adds nothing, it's pointless, it's useless. Doesn't give you any added value. Now here, I've moved literally four feet to the right hand side and we've got these lobster pots, which are filling the foreground and actually providing a sense of depth as well. Now, I'm not saying that this is a great composition. What I am saying is, is that, that this shot is more interesting than the shot previously. Now here, again, I've moved another 10 feet to the right hand side and compose this in a slightly different way again. And I don't know if you can see me. There we go. However, the way I've composed this now has all of these elements in there. We're breaking up the frame. We're giving depth into the actual video. We're showing the relative size of these in the distance. We've got these lobster pots that are grabbing your attention at the bottom and altogether the shot's a lot more interesting. Let me just step out of the frame and you can see for yourself. Now there are lots of things that you can use to generate and create foreground interest within a photo. Objects can form foreground interest quite easily and can actually be one of the main elements of a shot. At the same time, actually, the foreground interest could just be used to mimic the shape of something that's in the midground or in the distance. Often, you're using a number of different compositional guides and tools together to create a strong shot. How you use foreground interest is entirely up to your creativity. What I want you to do is to just think about how to include some foreground in your scene. Think about scale, think about color, think about texture, placement of those elements, and really try and work the scene. Whilst I'm in exactly the same location, I've come to the other side of the lobster pots to demonstrate another way to create strong compositions, and that's simplicity within a scene. Now here, I've taken all of the distracting elements out and I just have the arrangement of these boats. And I've tried to position the camera so I have some separation between the first boat and the second boat and the boat off to the left-hand side. Now together, there's a whole host of different things going on here. We've got the boat actually leading you through to the next boat, to the next boat, to the next boat. In effect, creating a lead-in line. 
We've also got simplicity here. There's a real monotone element to this and kind of a lot of flat contrast created by this mist. So there's really nothing to give you any distraction within the shot. In the distance, we've got the shoreline and the small jetty and pier jutting up, which also gives a little bit of a sense of scale. Now, I've not taken a photograph of this. However, there's definitely some shots to be had here. And all I've done within the past few moments is walk 20 feet and I've got completely different types of video, just as an example. Leading lines for me are typically best placed to the left. It's natural for people to view from the left to right, primarily because the majority of the world reads from left to right, so you tend to view things in that kind of way. However, they also work from right to left on occasion. Here we've placed a pier in the bottom right hand corner of this particular image. Now it takes you into what normally would be the focal point, which is a lighthouse. But here, because the entire pier and lighthouse are engulfed by a giant wave, the whole thing becomes a singular element and focal point. There's enough of the lighthouse sticking through between this exploding wave that you can still grasp what it is and, and what you're looking at. But once your eyes have rested on there, you will find that you're drawn from right to left, looking across the wave until you see this giant peak of a wave on the far left hand side of the image. It's an interesting journey, but it's a simple and uncomplicated journey. It works very, very well because of that simplicity and because there is a prescribed journey for the viewer through the shot. Now, the way that I'm shooting this, the sun is in my eyes, so I'm just gonna flick these sunglasses down so that I don't end up blinded. However, this particular composition of this video section here has been done to illustrate something called balance. Now, there are two elements within this shot. There are me and there's this hut. Now, in the background, the hut is obviously much smaller, so it takes less prominence than me in the frame. It's a secondary element within this composition and I am the primary focus of this particular section of video. I position myself to the right hand side, I've left some separation here between me and the other element and that allows me to have a bit of balance within the frame. I'm taking up the majority of the frame and you've got a secondary anchor point. Now if I actually step over a little bit and put myself more central and actually start to encroach into the background here you'll find that this shot isn't anywhere near as appealing and that's because I've lost separation I've lost isolation and also it doesn't feel anywhere near as balanced by bringing myself back over here just that little step to the right hand side hopefully demonstrates how balancing elements within a composition can make a real difference to the quality of your image here what I've tried to do is achieve overall balance within the shot and that's a really important concept. Making sure that the viewer feels as though the image that they're viewing has balance can be a real key skill. And it's quite hard to explain what balance is. Here we've got a number of different elements. We've got the tree, which is anchoring the mountain, which is on the right hand side. And we've got this foreground stream and rocks running through. The leading line here is also created to some extent by the light and the way in which the light falls, which is adding a lot of drama. And clearly we've got a very dramatic sky and a lot of contrast within this shot. I haven't put the camera really low and filled the foreground with lots of foreground interest. I've not really tried to accentuate any big rocks here. I've just gone for a simple view which has overall balance and harmony. And I think it actually achieves that quite well. The strong light is what really makes this image pop out and makes it really stand out on screen. There's nothing to distract the viewer. There's nothing to take them away from appreciating the beauty of the scene in front of them. And even though this is a relatively straight composition and straight shot, I think it still is very strong indeed. Let's use this little fisherman's hut as an example here. Now this is a really, really simple composition, really simple shot. We've got this isolated hut set against the texture of all of this grass and mist in the background. Now clearly there's a potential image to be taken here, maybe not today, not in these conditions. 
However, to the right hand side of this particular shot are the rest of these fishermen's huts. So if I pan to the right hand side, show you this, we have all of this going on over here. All of this clutter and mayhem. So you have a choice as to how you compose an image and how you set elements within that frame. What I'm going to do is walk a little bit further up to the left hand side of this hut and look back including it and also the rest of the other huts. One of the most important skills you can develop as a photographer is location analysis. Quite often when I arrive at a new location I'll actually leave the camera in the car and we'll just wander around and actually try and find shots with my eye looking and seeing if I can see something that stands out and appeals to me, something that I want to use to tell my story within an image. Following on from there, quite often I'll go back to a location time and again and over time you get to really understand that location and discover new things about it, quite often waiting for perfect light. There is no shortcut, you know, landscape photography in itself is a waiting game. You know, you have to be patient for the right conditions on the right day with the right composition, the right light. And ultimately, they're the things that are going to give you the best portfolio grade images. When I do decide to get the camera out, I'm wandering around and I'm trying lots of different things. So I'll be trying different focal lengths, different lenses. I'll be getting the camera really close to the ground. I'll be getting it higher up, looking at different vantage points. I'm looking for elements that I can use to frame and I'm looking for elements that may be the prime element within my shot and elements which may be a secondary element within my shot. Sometimes they'll reverse and what was a secondary element will become a prime element and vice versa. It's all a process of creativity and experimentation. You really have to go and put the work in if you want to get the best possible images. As you can see from where I am here at Redker and at South Gare. These fishing huts could be shot in themselves in lots of different ways. They can be the main element within a shot, or they could be foreground interest, or they could be a lead in line. They can all be used in lots of different ways, and that's only limited by you and your creativity as a photographer and an artist. It really doesn't matter if you're using rules of thirds, leading lines, frames within a frame, texture, colour, symmetry, doesn't matter which of these compositional guidelines and tools you use to create your shot. What really counts is the fact that you're actually thinking about how to do it and you actually have a process. Analysing and going back and reshooting and shooting and really working a location properly to get the best possible image will make images that stand out from the crowd and ultimately that's what you want to do. You want to walk away knowing that you've given it your all, you've put the work in and that you've created the strongest possible shots at that particular moment in time from that particular location. Remember you can always go back again in better conditions, better light. However, the more you've worked that scene and the more you know it, the more likely you are to have those compositions in your head for the next time for when those conditions are absolutely perfect. So we're now back from Redka and we're in the house and we're able to take a look at some photos in a little bit more detail and start to talk through why some of these images work and why some of these images don't. Let's talk about compositional guidelines and let's get started. Now the shot that I've pulled up here was taken recently um, within one of the vlog episodes that I shot during the storms that we had a few weeks ago when the beast from the east and storm Emma hit us. Um, this is an image that I took at Bambra Beach and it features the beach, the sea and the castle. <clears throat> it's a relatively simple composition. There's not a huge amount around there. There's quite a bit of negative space within the shot. Now clearly the focal element here that I want you to end up resting upon is the castle in the distance. However, I need to take the viewer on a journey to get there and here I've used an S-curve leading line which sweeps through from the bottom left hand side of the shot and actually takes you to that final focal point. Now I shot probably 40, 30, 40 images or so trying to capture the right type of motion in the wave 
and you're wanting either an interesting pattern or something to anchor the castle in the distance, whether or not that was repetition within the wave formation or whether or not it was a nice leading line as we ended up here. When I was going through this, I was quickly checking on the back of the screen very quickly to see if I had something that at kind of thumbnail size worked. I saw this one and I thought, that's the shot for me. I still carried on shooting afterwards just in case there wasn't something quite right. But it was clear when I got these back and opened them up in Lightroom that this was the strongest compositionally out of them all. Now clearly, if there's no foreground or no leading line there and you're shooting in the sea, all you can do is try and get your timing right and keep working until you actually get an image that's representative of the idea in your own head. Another way in which you can affect the composition of your photo is by the choice of lens. You might think to yourself, how the hell does lens selection have anything to do with composition? Well, in lots of ways, actually. Here, in this particular image, which is a shot of Black Rock Cottage in Glencoe, um, I have used a longer length lens. Longer length lens. There we go. So this was taken on a 70 to 200 f 2.8. And that starts to compress the perspective. Now, Black Rock Cottage and Etive Moor, which is a mountain in the background, are a little bit of distance apart. However, but by using the longer length lens, we're able to compress the perspective and make them appear closer than they are. Here, I've used a couple of other compositional tools though. I've filled the frame, actually, so I've compressed and really got quite a tight composition here to take out anything else in the background that was superfluous. Now, the conditions, again, on this day were incredibly wintry, very, very cold, and I wanted to depict that within this particular shot and give you a feeling of isolation and a feeling of drama and coldness and typical Scottish winter weather. And I think this particular image does that very, very well indeed. There's no real strong use of colour here. It's a relatively subdued palette. And overall, this is another one of my favourite images from around Glencoe. It does exactly what I set out to do, which is to give a clean, strong, powerful composition that represents a Scottish winter. And it's all been done through the use of a longer focal length lens. If I'd have shot this with a 16 to 35 mil or a 17 to 40 mil, then this would have looked very, very different indeed. I'd have had a hell of a lot more sky in there and also the uh, relative size of Etive Moor to, um, to the, the cottage itself would have been changed massively. So lens selection makes a big difference in terms of your composition. Now, if you've watched recent videos, you will have seen me shooting quite a few shots around Steetley Pier, just off the coast of Hartlepool. Now here we've got uh, an example of a wide angle shot. This was taken with a 16 to 35 or a 17 to 40. And we've got this big ass of the pier right in your face. Now, one of the advantages of the wide angle is that it actually distorts perspective. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about now. Altering perspective can be another great way to compose an image and take a viewer on a journey. So what have I done here? Well, the wide angle gets the big back end of that pier right in your face. So it's going to attract your attention pretty much straight away. We've also got repetition and texture here as well. In other words, a little bit of a pattern forming. We have the structure of the pier that's taking you on a journey from the left hand side of the frame to the right hand side of the frame. Now, the pier is obviously getting smaller. Because of the wide angle, the far end of the pier now looks very small indeed, and it's taking you out to this circular concrete block. But what it does do is lead your eye through. So we've got a direction. You'll also see the reflections in the bottom and the textures in the sand. They're also leading you in the same direction. There's nothing to take you away from where I ultimately want you to look. The other thing here is again, we've got triangles used within this composition as well. Again, not gonna talk about those too much, but you've got a triangular focus point coming in. There's a very strong journey for the viewer. It's really simple, but it's really powerful. Nothing to distract you. Really like this shot again.
by putting a wide angle lens really close to a foreground object you will amplify the size of that object within your composition the scale of a small rock with a lens 30 centimeters to 60 centimeters away will be magnified tenfold relative to the background that can help to build drama in this image i've taken the use of patterns a stage further and what I've done here is try and develop the ideas from the earlier shots at Steely and actually make them even more graphic and more representative of the shapes within the shot. So as you've seen from a couple of the other examples, I've used repetition and patterns to try and give you a little bit of a sense of the architecture of Steely Pier. Here, one of the key things in this image is the fact that it's a long exposure shot as well. So I've taken away all of the wave detail in the background and you're left with these really strong contrasting shadows from the sun on the right hand side of Steely Pier casting down onto the sand and the beach and then you've got all of that texture and geometric representation of the wood and the metalwork providing a little bit of contrast in there as well. Now if you look at this it's actually also blocked off into squares and rectangular shapes and there is also some use of triangles in here. This feels like a really well balanced shot to me and I really like it, it's quite easy to look at. But it's also abstract enough that, you know, as a viewer, you are kind of trying to work out exactly what it is and where it is. If you've got some local knowledge about the Northeast, you may well be able to suss out that this is Steely. To other viewers, I'm sure that in the end, they'll get there and realize that it's a pier or a structure next to the sea and the beach. Either way, I really like it. It's a fantastic shot. One of my favourites that I've taken recently at that particular location. And just another use of repetition and pattern to create a strong composition. Now, in this shot that I took in Swaledale in the Yorkshire Dales, we can see another example of using patterns. Although these patterns are slightly less geometric, they are patterns nonetheless and still provide some great foreground interest. As you look at this shot, the walls and these barns and the repetition of them lead the eye further into the shot, ultimately providing a little bit of a sense of depth to this image. They take you through into that mid-ground where you can see the hills and then in the distance we've got the interest of that cloud formation and some beautiful sunset colours. How you use patterns within the image is entirely up to you. In this case I've used them as foreground interest and to lead you through the shot. But in some landscape images, they may well fill the entire frame and provide a really graphic geometric representation of the scene that's in front of you. There are no hard and fast rules. I've opened up another image to give you an example of use of patterns within composition. This image was taken a while ago and is also taken at Paddy's Hole near Redka. Now this time we've used a drone and we're looking straight down onto the boat that we've seen in this video. Here we've got an incoming higher tide, so we've got all of the water lifting them and giving you a really clean background. This is a very abstract shot, but it makes use of patterns because quite simply the boats are forming a directional view in the image. They're all roughly pointing in the same direction and there's also odd splashes of colour. It feels abstract, there's repetition and there's pattern. And that's one of the advantages of drone photography. Quite often you can look down on the world and view patterns that you otherwise wouldn't see. But don't limit yourself just to shooting patterns with your drone. Make sure that you're also looking for and shooting patterns with your camera as well. Even though there are no rules to composition, breaking the rules is one of the things which I love to do most. Actually, in most things in life on occasion. Here, I've got an image that I took looking across from El Gol to the Coolins on the Isle of Skye. I was shooting wider angle shots at this stage, actually filling in the frame with some of the classic foreground interest rocks that form part of that coastline. I spotted this incoming storm cloud coming over the Coolin and decided to use a longer lens to take a couple of images. Now here we've got the compression which is being created by using the longer lens. And what I've done is to try and centrally compose the mountain. Central compositions don't work, do they? 
or so some people would tell you. Here, I think it works quite well. What I've also done though, is I've tried to create equal thirds between the sea, the mountain, and the band of storm cloud at the top of the shot. So again, I'm trying to approach this image at the time of creating it to have some sense of balance. There's a subtle luminosity difference between each of those thirds, and there's also a subtle color change between each of those thirds. So this kind of harmonious palette, harmonious breakdown of space that's occupied within the frame and the central composition lead you straight in there. And this becomes a study of both texture, color, and also of weather. It's an image that I really like. I'm quite happy to have this one in my portfolio. Do you think this shot works? Would you have taken this image? Or are you so focused at the time of shooting that potentially you miss out on other opportunities? Comment below, let me know. Well, let's talk about an analysis of an image overall, and let's actually have a look at all of the compositional tools that have been used to generate a shot. So what I've done is I've put an image on screen, which is an image that's taken by drone. So we're using a drone image here. And this is an image of Roka Pier looking back towards the coast. So the drone is actually out over the sea. We will not be able to take this shot with anything other than a helicopter. That simple. So the drone gives you a unique perspective. So first of all, it allows you to put the camera in an unusual position. That position is 300, 250 feet in the air in this case. Now, as you're looking back, you've got the pier and the lighthouse right at the end. We've got that little splash of red on there, which drags your eye straight in. And that's providing some foreground interest. That also sits within a big gap of negative space, which is from the sea. There's nothing else there but it does have some beautiful texture and light on the sea as well. The pier at the back of the lighthouse then is leading you in. Now, I literally adjusted the height of the drone repeatedly until I got enough separation from the lighthouse and the mid-ground, which are the little cliff in the background of the houses, and so the, the, the pier would lead your eye in after you had been attracted to the lighthouse. That takes you through into that mid-ground. And then we've got a little bit of detail there. In the background, in the far distance, we've got that fantastic sunset happening, which is really bright, really intense. And again, we've got some beautiful blue colors in the sky, which are matching the sea. So there's a lot of use of color within this image as well. So I think this is one of the best shots that I've taken of Rokopia by drone. It's probably one of the best shots that I've taken of Rokopia. I've seen a couple of, of other people using drone shots and they tend to look out to sea. So they've come in, they've got the close in and they've got great images. I've shot those myself, but I've not seen anybody shoot it quite in this particular composition. So I like the uniqueness of it too. Overall, this is a really powerful image, but what's important here is that there's a number of different elements all working together. And at the time of taking this shot, kind of running through them in my mind, some consciously, some probably subconsciously as I'm trying to get the image right. And I shot quite a few images. I adjusted the, the position of the drone, higher, lower, left, right, centralize the subject to put the subject off center. So I played around whilst doing this and obviously I've got 20 odd minutes on the drone battery. Sunset was coming down, I waited for the light. Once I'd seen on screen something that I thought was great, it was literally just a matter of keeping the drone in position and as the light was changing and trying to shoot off those images. Out of the images that I shot, this was definitely the best one. It was the strongest one. The light was the best. And ultimately it's the light that really makes this image pop and makes it stand out. So point being lots and lots of different things coming together to create one image. Don't just get hooked on thinking about one particular way in which the composer shot. Try and use two or three different elements together to further increase the strength and visual narrative, visual storytelling of your image. 
Now I've popped an image on screen here which is a non-landscape image and I want to do a little bit of analysis of this shot because it really demonstrates a couple of the techniques that we've talked about quite well. So first of all we've got some framing going on here which is from the right hand side this kind of wire metal fence and a barbed wire which is slightly silhouetted against the background and that frames the model on the left hand side of the shot. Now, if you'll notice also, there's a um, similar use of, of colour palette here, that juxtaposition of these sort of blues. Everything kind of fits together quite well. And also the style of dress in this shot really works well with the scene, the hat, etc. We've created quite a lot of separation here by the introduction of some, some flash. So the flash in here, shot off camera, really adds some drama and it makes the image pop and stand out. So what have we got going on? We've got the use of colour, separation and isolation, and also some framing within this particular image. You'll also notice as well, even though I hate to say it, you know, the image is actually slightly using the rule of thirds a little bit, kind of. One more quick photo of Gainer here, shot also in Newcastle. This was taken on Newcastle's high level bridge. Totally different lighting conditions on this particular shoot. We've got beautiful, strong, bright sunlight coming through. But again, we've still got the same things going on. We've got natural framing. We've got the verticals and shapes on the left-hand side of the shot coming all the way through. And we've got a subject that's placed actually quite close to the edge. But it all leads you through. You've got this beautiful warm light coming into Gainer's face. You've got those sunglasses which attract a little bit of attention as well. There's a bit more landscape in this because the background's a bit more cluttered, there's a bit more detail in there, a bit more texture. But again, you're still drawn to the subject through the framing and through the light. That's what works and what makes this image quite a strong pop image. Something that I really like, one of my favourite shots that I've taken over the years of Gainer. And uh, yes, I hope you like it too. But again, feel free to comment below. Does this shot work for you? Does the shot that I showed you before work? Can you apply some of the techniques from these two images back into your photography for landscapes? You'll see again, we've still got the separation and isolation going on because of the aperture, which was shot really wide. So all of that background is thrown out of focus and we're getting the texture without too much detail, we're getting all of the light without too much detail. Thank you for watching this video. If you have enjoyed it, then please like, share and subscribe. Don't forget to click the little bell icon, which means that you'll get regular updates about new content when it's released. Also, please comment below. Let me know your thoughts on this particular video. Tell me more about what you might like to see in upcoming videos as well. That's it for now. I'll see you again next time. Take care.